By popular request, today we look at Mama Bear's evidence for a resurrection. Clearly, organization and planning are not high priorities for Mama Bears, as the video we see today is called Resurrection Evidence Part 1 on which facts do even skeptics agree? This video was released nine months ago, and part two has yet to make its debut. So I guess we have part one of one. I've also had requests to cover Gary Habermas's minimal facts. Judging from the title of this video, we may get a twofer here, as this is the title of Habermas's work. Are these ladies just going to regurgitate Habermas's work? Possibly. Habermas still hasn't finished the book that he's been working on for the last 46 years, but Habermas has been talking about the book for decades, so there is plenty available on the topic. Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. Dr. Richard Carrier has some new online courses available that I think look exciting and are great for further information on this topic. Go to this link to get more information about the course. If you sign up, you will also be helping my channel as well. So please, if this interests you at all, check out Dr. Carrier's course. The link is also in the description. Dr. Carrier is a historian with expertise in first century Roman history, the very topic that we are covering today. Hey there, Mama Bears. Welcome to another podcast with Mama Bear Apologetics. I'm Amy Davis. Amy got her computer fixed and Trisha has a better camera angle on this one. Well done. Now we at Mama Bear, we are so blessed to have an amazing speaker with us for this whole series. Whole series? Not only has part two never been seen, Trisha has never been seen on this channel again after this was made. Amy next has Trish give her bio. As you may recall, Trish was a nurse but decided to make a career change and get a PhD in apologetics. She's written a few books, has an out-of-date website that lists her as having an MS and an MA, and an upcoming speaking event in 2019. Yes, the website also is not a priority. You and Hillary, you guys have talked about the importance of the resurrection, and now we're shifting to the historicity, meaning the yeah. historical likelihood that this did actually occur. Right. And this can be a bit of a tension point, especially for skeptics, because again, it is highly supernatural. You do not have people rising from the dead on a regular occurrence. It is just, it's mind blowing. Yes, that is what makes it an extraordinary claim. Thus, to be believable, you need extraordinary evidence for it. And so the goal of looking at the historicity of the resurrection is, again, to bring it down to likely uh, things that we can all agree on. And by meaning all, I'm meaning whether you are a, a skeptic, a naturalist, atheist, agnostics, these are the points that everybody can agree with. And uh, it's to help open doors for conversation. Cool. We are going to agree with all of her evidence. Can't wait. And one of the people who sort of yeah. spearheaded this movement, uh, not really movement, but just this train of thought was Gary Habermas. Called it. Might be getting a twofer here if they represent him well. But what Habermas wanted to do is get past this merry-go-round of arguing among scholars which historical events surrounding Jesus' death do we all agree on. Which is a good idea. When the believing scholars can't agree on the facts, it doesn't give the skeptic reason to think that any of them are right. And so he decided to set, establish the minimal facts, the basic ones, and he has both short lists of four or five, and then a longer list of 12 and even more than that. He started with a list of 12, but the five that are left are the ones that are agreed upon. And we also have a, a variety of scholars writing about this now. And so some of their lists do vary uh, a little bit. So we're going to derive our list and bring you some that we pulled from various scholars uh, that may differ with another scholar. 
Yeah, they're re- they're really helpful. And yeah, like like Trisha said, some of these do vary a little bit. Um, at like Jay Warner Wallace, he he has slightly different ones compared to Habermas. But either way, these are these are just easy ones that everybody, regardless of of your faith background, can discuss and come around. If these are all agreed upon, then why do others have different lists? Sounds to me like even other Christian apologists still don't agree on the alleged facts. But there had to be a bit of criteria on how these were going to be agreed upon. And there were two things that were settled on. Is One is that it must be confirmed by several strong and independent arguments. That sounds like good criterion. What meets that criterion? So again, these had to be reasonable. They had to be rational. And they weren't just reasonable from a naturalistic perspective. They had to be reasonable from within scripture too. These were also supported through extra biblical sources and historians. And most of these sources and historians, they were not scripture because they say, well, you can't really trust it. Because again, the people who wrote it believed in God. So therefore they are suspect. No, that's not the reason. The reason is if the source is your book, then it's a single source, and it doesn't fit the criterion that you just gave. It should go without saying that if you are seeking independent sources to confirm your Bible claims, that the Bible can't be one of those sources. If you want to list three sources, the Bible being one for an event, that's fine. But if the point is to affirm what the Bible says, then the Bible can't affirm itself. You need an independent source. And so they will put this as multiple sources. And so these sources are great. They're not as many as what's in scripture. We have thousands upon thousands within scripture. The glitches are in the original video. Maybe Amy's computer still isn't working right. But Amy's characterization of why the skeptic wants extra biblical sources for the resurrection claims misses the mark. The authors aren't suspect because they believed what they wrote. Rather, these authors are making extraordinary claims. Therefore, the claims that they make need corroborating sources to affirm their claims. No one, believer, skeptic, judge, witness, anyone, can corroborate their own testimony by making another claim. A witness can corroborate their own evidence with facts, but the facts need to be independently verified. For example, the police see a car that has run into a stoplight, and they accuse the driver of being careless. The driver says he wasn't careless, another car hit him from behind, causing him to hit the stoplight, and then that other car took off. The statement alone won't allay the suspicion that this driver was careless. If the driver then says the other car was a red jag, that doesn't help. It's just an additional detail, but it doesn't corroborate the driver's claims. It's just another claim at this point. If the police then see the rear bumper of the driver's car and that it is damaged, now they have corroborating evidence. If they later find a red jag with front end damage, that's even much stronger corroborating evidence of the claim. Do you see, Amy, why the driver making more claims is worthless until there is something to corroborate the claims? Sure, these sources are just uh, a few. But it sounds to me like Amy is preparing her audience to be underwhelmed. We have lots of evidence for the resurrection, but most of it is just the Bible. They are, they don't take away from scripture. They contribute to it. And actually scripture expands upon all of these. Scripture expands on all of these, makes it sound like the Bible was written to support these other sources. So they are rooted by ancient historians such as Josephus, Tacitus, whom we shall meet here shortly. Really? Are you having a seance? The archaeological discoveries that have been made have backed up the Bible to the extent that archaeologists actually bring Bibles with them because they help them make discoveries. This is false. While there are some who go into the field of archaeology with the intent of affirming the Bible, that is not the norm. Interestingly, Eliot Mazar was a non-religious modern biblical archaeologist who said she dug with a spade in one hand and a Bible in the other. Her work in Jerusalem is respected by her peers. However, some of her finds, like a seal that she believed to be Isaiah's and a wall that she dated to be part of the original Temple of Solomon, are met with skepticism. Despite not all of her claims being widely accepted, she herself is well respected in her field. Biblical archaeology began as a movement in the 1830s, after the Rosetta Stone was deciphered in the 1820s, making it possible to interpret finds in ancient Babylon and Assyria. 
but by the Second World War, academics were finding Christian scholars straining to align their finds with the Bible. The field continued to expand when Israel conquered East Jerusalem, including the Old City with its many religious sites, in the Six-Day War in 1967. The country's archaeologists gained access to the heart of the Holy Land that had long been under Jordanian occupation. Benjamin Mazar, grandfather to Iliad, received the first permit to dig. For many Israeli Jews, Benjamin Mazar's discoveries provided physical evidence backing Israel's claim to Jerusalem as its eternal capital. There is no reason to doubt the accuracy of the biblical description, Mazar has insisted. The Bible is quite careful in its use of going up and going down. This was just the sort of literal interpretation that many of her colleagues avoided, given that biblical accounts of this era were written several centuries later by scribes with a political agenda. But the elder Mazar encouraged his granddaughter to stay true to Scripture, pour over it again and again, she recalled him telling her shortly before he died, for it contains within it descriptions of genuine historical reality. However, soon after the revelations of the David inscriptions and the elder Mazar's death, archaeologist Israel Finkelstein of Tel Aviv University rocked the biblical archaeological community. Based on an analysis of the pottery, he asserted in 1996 that the archaeological clock used by Mazar and others was off by a century or more. That meant that the monumental structures at the sites outside of Jerusalem attributed to Solomon, such as the city gates, in fact dated to long after his purported reign, changing the entire understanding of the history of Israel. For Finkelstein and many of his allies, the Mazars were chasing a chimera. There had been no glittering early capital, no large empire, no treasure-filled tombs as described in the Bible. The legends of David and Solomon were simply the imaginings of a golden age created by later scribes. He argued that David was little more than a tribal chieftain and Jerusalem a scruffy mountaintop village. Mazar's finds continued to be controversial. As Dr. Josh Bowen points out in The Atheist's Guide to the Old Testament, archaeology is about finding the data points, then putting together history based on the majority of the data points starting with the conclusion and then trying to prove the conclusion by the data one finds is not the way to discover history. Mazar would counter with, such a view is common among many archaeologists who believe that they can fully separate themselves from the political reality. That is, at best, a deeply naive position, given that political and religious agendas continue to drive archaeology, and in many parts of the world, not just in Jerusalem. Or, as U.S. excavator Sarah Parkat put it, politics is just a crucial part of archaeology. So long as archaeologists dig, what they find and how it is interpreted will be fuel for those eager to control the present, which is exactly what our Mama Bear apologist team attempts to do here. Even Josephus' writings have been used by archaeologists to be able to discover tombs and cities. It's just fantastic, the richness and the historical accuracy that are found within these documents. She's so convinced that her Bible is historically accurate that she compares using it to find historical sites to using Josephus. The difference is much of the Bible history has been proven to be either false or greatly exaggerated. But the places generally are real places. The people? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's hard to tell. With ancient history, it's nearly impossible to prove that a person didn't exist, like Abraham. But when he's supposed to be as an important person to history as the Bible claims, not finding anything historical to back up his existence does make him sus. The point is, Josephus was a historian. The Bible is a collection of stories, poems, sayings, letters, and so on to promote a religious viewpoint. It isn't a historical document. Some events recorded in it really did happen, but that doesn't make it a history book. So that's the first one is it has to be confirmed by several strong and independent arguments. And the second one is that it's generally accepted by the majority of biblical, meaning uh, both believing and secular scholars and historians. Super. I'm with you on this one, Amy. Show me that your claims can meet these criteria. 
They don't require belief and affirmation in the divine or supernatural events. That's really what makes it that common ground is again, you don't have to affirm divinity to agree that these things did occur. This is a bit odd because you can't have a resurrection without a supernatural event. You also can't claim that there's a God involved in any of it if all of the evidence is for natural things happening. Now I'm intrigued. How are they going to bridge this gap from evidence of natural things to a God causing a resurrection? And if, especially if you've got a skeptic within the family, this is something easily that you guys can discuss. And if you don't, but you want to discuss it with a skeptic, just ask me. I'd be happy to. We just need to remember, as we covered in the first part podcast, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central assertion of Christianity. And it's what distinguishes Christianity from all other world religions, is that Jesus Christ, uh, according to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul said, I deliver to you as a first importance what I also received, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. First, I'm wondering why Trish qualifies the resurrection as according to 1 Corinthians. Is this because the Apostles' Creed is not, in fact, confirmed by the Gospels, but has a version of the story that differs? It's also noteworthy that when this creed was composed, and even when it was written, the Old Testament was the only scriptures it could be referring to. As a believer, I always thought that it referred to the Gospels, never giving thought to the fact that even Bible scholars agree that none of the Gospels had been written before 1 Corinthians was written. In this respect, the creed is obviously wrong. The creed says that Jesus was buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures, but there is no Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah will be buried and raised on the third day. The creed also makes no mention of the women that allegedly were the first to know about the resurrection, at least according to the Gospels. All right, so let's kick off these minimal facts. So we're only going to go through four. Again, if you want to look up uh, Dr. Hazen at Habermas, they have more than just these four, but we're just going to cover these um, for today because these are easy to remember. They're great discussion points to have with your kiddos. Let's not have to actually work at this. Heaven forbid. But will these four actually be evidence of a resurrection? The very first minimal fact that is generally conceded by all sides is that Jesus was crucified and buried. Okay, I'll grant her that one. Jesus was crucified and buried. I think everyone who is not a mythicist would agree with this much. So again, we have this within the wealth of thousands upon thousands of biblical documents, but I do want to highlight a little bit of the extra biblical sources because oftentimes with skeptics, that's what they defer to. So what's important to remember though, is while these are often conceded to as like, oh, these are the best ones. These are the ones we should go to because they weren't tied to the vote or to the direct apostles that were right there. The problem is with these ones, they often were written later which isn't necessarily a problem. Again, we do have historical accounts that come later, but that's often what the goal is, is to find the earliest source document, which is scripture. I'll grant that looking at what was first written about an event or a person is more likely to be accurate. But note how Amy characterizes the first writings as scripture. She's not wrong, but in the minds of her audience, like I would have when I was a believer, this conjures up a picture of the Bible as a whole. It implants the idea that the Gospels were the earliest writings about Jesus, but that isn't the case. 1 Thessalonians was most likely the first portion of the New Testament that was written, and this, 1 Corinthians, came about two years later. Most noteworthy is the first writing we have about Jesus is from someone who never even met Jesus, and he based what he wrote on a vision he had, not anything he heard from anyone that had, in fact, met Jesus. Paul did know Peter, but he makes it clear that he did not get his theology from Peter, but from his visions. He and Peter disagreed on theology. Peter considered Christianity to be a subset of Judaism and thought that pagans that converted to Christianity needed to first become Jewish. Paul disagreed. Paul obviously won out. So we don't get Christian theology from someone who met Jesus even indirectly. Rather, the theology is based on Paul's visions. You would think that if while Jesus was alive, or soon after his death, 
anyone thought that Jesus was a pivotal point in human history or the most important person who ever lived or God himself, that someone would have written something about him. Or if there was a God that thought that knowing about Jesus was the most important thing in human history, he would have at least nudged someone to write about it maybe one of Jesus' followers, or at least a historian. But no, the first thing we get about Jesus is from someone that never knew him, nor did he base what he wrote on talking to people who knew him. And so these often do come later, and there aren't as many copies as the original New Testament documents. And how many original New Testament documents do we have? Zero. We have zero copies or fragments of original New Testament documents. The earliest fragment that we have dates to the 2nd century and is a business card-sized fragment of the Gospel of John. Okay, so what we're going to look at right now, the first one is the Talmud. So this is found in the Babylonian Talmud 43a. It actually confirms the crucifixion. It says at one point that a herald had cried out, he's going to be stoned because he practiced sorcery, but he was later hanged on Passover Eve. You seem to have left out the parts that don't agree with your version of the story. That a herald cried out for any that would speak on his behalf, and they waited 40 days and carried out the sentence when none came, first stoning him and half of his disciples, and then hanging him alone. Since you consider this to be a historical source, on what basis did you determine that the parts that agree with your version of the story are true, but the parts that don't agree are false. So, and we know that the Jews often accuse Jesus of practicing sorcery. That's where they thought he got his power. It couldn't have been from God. So this is an interesting addition through the Talmud saying, okay, they thought that he was a sorcerer and he, and originally this herald thought that he was going to be stoned, but he was hanged, which is a euphemism for being crucified on Passover Eve. Did you read the account? It doesn't say that they thought he would be stoned, It says that he was stoned. He survived the stoning, and then they hung him. I notice that you tell your readers what it says instead of showing them the text. Is this because you don't want them to see the whole thing, or because you never read it either? You are only passing on what you have heard. Then we have Tacitus. He was born in 56 AD, so after the crucifixion of Christ. He was a first century Roman historian, and often among modern historians, he's actually considered the greatest Roman historian. So his writings are are well-respected. She's right that Tacitus is a well-respected ancient historian. He was born in the first century, but his annals were written in the second century. This is going to be important in a bit. And what he said in his writing is Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procreator, oof, excuse me for my pronunciation, of Judea in the reigning of Tiberius. So again, very specific detail. We have Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death, who he was put to death by, and who he was uh, in charge of in Judea during the reigning of Tiberius. She's right here, bolstered by the fact that Tacitus had a low opinion of Christians. In this passage that she's referring to, Tacitus calls Christianity a most mischievous superstition, and he says that they engage in shameful practices. Okay, Amy, so Jesus was crucified and died. We still don't have any evidence of a resurrection, and we are more than halfway through your video. Slightly uh, earlier, we have Josephus. He was actually born 37 AD. So shortly after the crucifixion of Christ, we have Josephus. He was a Roman Jewish historian. And Josephus has a little bit of baggage here. He was actually considered a traitor among the Jews. Uh, he did report on a lot of Roman history. He was a military leader. So he was he was looking back into ancient Judea. And again, archaeologists used a lot of Josephus' writings to be able to make modern discoveries. Now, Josephus, with this passage that we're going to be made, it is known that later historians actually inputted a little bit of a clip here who says, who was the Christ? That was added later. So some people have said, okay, well, you can't Josephus' account on who Christ was because of this later edition. But no, as Jay Warner Wallace points out in Cold Case Christianity, that's just what's considered an artifact. That's actually not problematic. The fact that we have copies of his writings, we're able to look at the two and figure out, okay, wait, this was a later edition. This is what he actually said. So this quote that I'm about to read to you is what was he, what he actually said. 
and says, at this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus and his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. And again, we are only supporting that Jesus died. We don't even know who Josephus is talking about here. Jesus was a common name, but let's just assume it's your Jesus. And the last one here I want to uh, want to share with you is Mara Bara. Uh, oh, help me out, Trisha. Uh, Ser- Serapian. We'll just skip this one since we're already granting that Jesus died by crucifixion. And this is important is because even today, there are still people who say, well, Jesus wasn't actually crucified. We don't have evidence. And no, we do. We have lots of documents. The mythicist position is a minority position, but it is gaining in popularity. These are just great sources that we can look at that were written within the lifetime of the apostles who were witnesses to it. They went to the original sources, and here we have evidence that, yes, he did die in the crucifixion. Stop the train, Amy. That is quite the claim. First, that the disciples were still alive when Tacitus wrote his account. Where are you getting this from? None of the disciples, save Peter and John, are ever heard from after Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, other than the death of James in Acts chapter 12. Your church tradition, where you claim that they were all martyred, has no dates for most of these. This source has all of them dead by 70 CE, except for John, whom it claims lived to 120 CE. And if that was true, then he became a disciple when he must have been an infant and Jesus carried him around and he lived to be 90. Either that or maybe he was a 10-year-old kid that lived to be 100. This source indicates that the dates of the apostles' death are unknown even by church tradition. Either way, Tacitus didn't write his annals until about 110 CE. This passage is in volume 44, one of the later volumes. The disciples were all dead, with the possible exception of John, who, if still alive, is exiled on an island where no one has access to him. And even if Tacitus did have access to John, for John to still be alive would mean he had to have been a child when he saw any of this, making him an unreliable source. Then, on top of all that, don't forget that Tacitus had a very low opinion of Christians. Remember he called them superstitious and accused them of shameful practices? Why would Tacitus go and consult with them in writing his history? I'm not sure where Amy is pulling this from, but the idea that Tacitus spoke to the disciples in writing his annals is preposterous. So, Tricia, let's get to some fun stuff. You have got some great evidence within archaeology. Just lay that on us. Yeah, this is sort of corroborating evidence. In other words, the evidence I'm about to share with you, it is, its purpose is not to prove the claims of the New Testament, but it is to show consistency with biblical assertions. Let me guess. The Bible got some names and places right, so it's more likely to be right on the facts, too. Is that it? I'm just going to share three archaeological finds that support Jesus' death burial uh, and the people that were surrounding that event at the time. Nailed it. The people were real people. Notice also that this was supposed to be supporting Jesus' death and burial. If she has evidence of Jesus being buried in a tomb, though, that will be quite interesting as no one claims to know Jesus was buried. Go to Israel, like I did with a Christian group, and they'll show you a tomb and say that this could have been Jesus' tomb, but no one knows. Caesarea Maritima was a location different from the other Caesarea Philippi, but this location was a harbor, an artificial harbor that Herod built, and it was magnificent. And so in 1961, Italian archaeologists excavated the ancient Roman amphitheater in that area. And I've I've sat in that amphitheater. They unearthed a piece of limestone that was inscribed with a dedication to Tiberius Caesar. And it was from, quote, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. So what? Has anyone ever questioned Pilate being a real historical person? I question the historicity of the Exodus story, but not the historicity of the pharaohs. 
If you bring me proof that Ramses was a real person, this isn't evidence that the Exodus actually happened. What skeptics doubt from the Gospels regarding Pilate isn't his existence, but rather his being portrayed as a weak leader that bowed to the wishes of the Jewish people. There is evidence that he may have been just the opposite, which would be evidence that your story got the factual details wrong. It's the factual details that we are interested in here, not the evidence of the Roman authorities' existence. The second one is Caiaphas's ossuary. Now, Caiaphas was one of the high priests, along with his father-in-law, uh, Annas, uh, served in that role at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And, and Caiaphas was one of the leaders plotting to kill Jesus Christ after he raised Lazarus from the dead, because you're not supposed to do things like that. She's right about Caiaphas's ossuary being a historical find that confirms his existence as probable. There is general acceptance that Caiaphas was high priest at the time of Jesus' death. But the claim that Caiaphas was plotting Jesus' death is just... And Trisha's claim that it was because he raised Lazarus from the dead and you're not supposed to do that doesn't even rise to that level. Not sure where she got these claims from. Since she doesn't support them, there's no reason to even consider them. Further, Jesus allegedly raised two other people from the dead as well, and there's no record of anyone claiming that it was wrong to raise someone from the dead. It was also done in the Old Testament as well. Elijah raised the widow's son, and the Bible doesn't say Elijah was not supposed to do that. So, no idea where she is getting this idea from. The third find is an amazing one from the first century in Palestine. Uh, the first century archaeologist, uh, Vasilios Saveris, Saveris, I think is how you pronounce it, says that thousands of people were crucified in Palestine during the first century. Seriously? Thousands of people were crucified, so Jesus might have been as well? Skipping her source for this says, I don't think anyone really doubts this, hoping we get to something that actually deals with the resurrection. How about making an ossuary uh, with, you know, uh, cardboard or something with your kids and, and show them how to put the bones that you make out of cardboard in there? Right, because making little coffins and reminding kids that they will die and be put in a coffin is such a fun thing to do with children. Why is this religion so obsessed with death? Is because when when I think of crucifixion, I would think, oh my gosh, this this had to have broken bones. But there's actually, and we'll include this within the links, is you can actually see the ankle bone where the hole is, it, it's bored all the way through and the ankle didn't break. I mean, it's it's excruciating to look at. I was intrigued by this one because there is no such thing as a single ankle bone. The ankle is made up of seven bones. The nail is through the calcaneus, the heel, which is also one of the ankle bones. If you're squeamish about ancient bones, look away because I'm going to show the picture that she's talking about. Here it is. There is a hole in the bone, as you see. This would have the ankle nailed from the side, not the front, as we are accustomed to seeing it in pictures of crucifixion victims. It certainly makes it unlikely that one nail was used for the feet, as they would have to have turned them to the side. We've got our, our four middle facts. So the first one was crucifixion. The second was that he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Now you have my attention, especially since this is not even included in Habermas's most recent video on the argument. These six facts are facts upon which virtually all experts in the field agree. That's significant. Let's take a look at each of these facts. Fact number one is Jesus died by crucifixion. Atheist, liberal, moderate, or conservative scholars agree that Jesus really existed and was executed on a cross. Next comes the fact that Jesus' early followers had experiences a short time later that they thought were appearances of Jesus. Habermas has accepted that this is not a fact agreed to by most scholars. Why do you ladies think otherwise? Now, some have suggested that perhaps the reason the tomb appeared empty was because the disciples went to the wrong tomb. It was just a simple mistake, right? Wait a minute. I thought you were going to support that Jesus was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Rather, you claim you are going to support this, but instead shift to what explains why the women and or disciples found an empty tomb. Was this bait-and-switch intentional, or did you really not see that you changed topics here? Just a simple mistake, right? Not exactly. 
The earliest and best attested facts about the death and resurrection of Jesus involve Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. They saw where Jesus was going to be buried. Mm -hmm. Joseph of Arimathea himself was a member of the Jewish court, and the location of the tomb was very well known. Was it? No one knows where it is today. I suppose if anyone wanted to know where the tomb was then, they could just ask Joseph of Arimathea. But again, you are missing a crucial step here. Was Jesus ever even buried there? We don't know. Many scholars hold that Jesus may have been thrown into a mass grave along with the other criminals that were crucified. The only evidence of this tomb burial is... Not only that, you had Roman guards that were stationed out front, and there was actually a seal that was placed upon this tomb. There was no missing this. They knew where it was. He was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Challenges have been raised, but those are quite easily debunked. How so? You didn't give any support for your claim. You clearly think you did, but think about it for a minute. If I say that I hid a million dollars worth of gold coins in a pot in a storm drain behind my house, but all of the coins sprouted legs and ran away, you then say you don't believe me, and I tell you to go look for yourself, and lo and behold, you find an empty pot in the storm drain. Are you now going to believe that I put a million dollars of gold coins in that pot and that all the coins sprouted legs and ran away? Of course not. An empty pot is no more proof of my claim to have put gold in the pot than your empty tomb claim is proof that there ever was a body in it, let alone Jesus' body. This fact about where the tomb was located, it is accounted for in the earliest gospel, which is Mark, and it is also corroborated by Matthew, John, and Paul in 1 Corinthians. Actually, that is not true. Mark's gospel, the earliest one, says that Joseph of Arimathea asked for the body of Jesus and that he put it in a tomb. He doesn't say that he put it in his tomb. Since this is supposed to be a discussion of the facts, it might be a good idea to verify your facts, especially when it is so easy for your audience to do so. The third is, and this one is actually the one when we were looking at the list here, is some will have this as their top four minimal facts, some won't. Grutais does, so that's why I'm going to mention it. And this is the fact that the tomb was empty. Now we know where Amy is getting her minimal facts from, and it isn't Gary Habermas. It's Douglas Grutius. I am Groot! Problem is that I, along with most skeptics and some Bible scholars, don't agree that there was an empty tomb, which is why Habermas doesn't include an empty tomb in his minimal facts. We haven't even established that Jesus was ever in a tomb, remember? We have no need of accounting for an empty tomb because you never established the evidence for a tomb burial in the first place. It's also important for this tomb to be empty because, you know, that's what makes the resurrection possible. Since you never established that Jesus was buried in a tomb and your only evidence of an empty tomb is the Bible says so, then you have no evidence of a resurrection. You haven't even laid the groundwork for a reasonable possibility. Case closed. There is no evidence of a resurrection. And if the Jews had wanted to stop this Christian movement, all they would have to do is turn up the body. Could they? If he was dumped in a mass grave or left to be eaten by scavengers, could they have found the body or even enough of the body to do this? And even if they could, why would they? Christianity at this point has a handful of followers. It's far more likely that the Jewish leaders felt confident that now that the leader of Christianity was dead, it was no threat to them. Christianity was even considered to be a subset of Judaism at this point, with Peter making the argument to Paul the Greek converts must first obey the Jewish law. Because this is a small sect, it is no threat to Judaism, and there was no reason for the Jewish leaders to want to disprove these claims. And, you know, sometimes this whole stealing the body thing, too. Well, the thing is, is they didn't have refrigeration back then. So a decomposing body gets very nasty and messy very quickly. Trisha's a nurse. She, she probably has some experience in this to where this would not have been easily done, plus the smell as well. It would have been highly complicated. We have another self-debunking apologist here. Amy makes the claim that the Jewish leaders could just produce the body and end Christianity but then claims that the disciples could not take the body because it would be too decomposed. 
If the disciples stole the body, they would have done so within 36 hours of his death. If the Jewish leaders wanted to produce the body to stamp out the resurrection claims, it would not be until at least several days later when they would hear such claims. So why is it harder for the disciples to take the body due to decomposition than the Jewish leaders to produce it when the Jewish leaders would need to move the body after several more days of decomposition? It was also common back then for Jews, like what we had just discussed, to where if somebody had died, they intended to wait and put these bones within the ossuary as preparation for the future resurrection. But they didn't do this with Jesus's body. How do you know? What is your source for this claim? I actually agree that she likely is right, but for a different reason, as it's more likely that Jesus was thrown in a mass grave and no one knows where the body is. Point number four is this one, again, has a little bit of variation. Uh, sometimes the fourth point is pointed back to being the growth of the early church. Other times it's referred to as the disciples transformation, as well as the affirmation of postmortem experiences. And this is worth noting is that the disciples went basically from wimps to being completely bold to the point that they were willing to lay their lives down. What is your source for this claim? It's interesting that Amy has pulled another bait and switch that almost got past me. She started the video claiming that she was going to present evidence that even most skeptics agree with, the Habermas approach to minimal facts. But only her first point, that Jesus was crucified, is on the list of facts that most scholars agree on. None of the remaining points fit the bill that Amy claimed that she could produce in the way of evidence. As to this final claim, it's really three separate claims, that there was rapid growth of the early church, that the disciples were transformed, and that there were post-resurrection experiences. The rapid growth of the early church is a myth. By the end of the first century, there were only about 7,500 Christians, or 0.2% of the population of the Roman Empire. The church didn't experience rapid growth until it got state support, when Constantine made it the official religion of the empire in 313 CE. Until then, the Christians were divided on what the correct beliefs were, what the correct teachings were, what the nature of Jesus was, and which writings were sacred, and even how to worship. The council at Nicaea, convened by Constantine in 325, set official beliefs and practices. As to the disciples, again, most of them disappear after Pentecost, no one knows if they were bold or spoke up for the religion. We do have some documentation for Peter being the head of the church, but disagreement on doctrine and practice is confirmed even in the Bible when Peter and Paul disagree about keeping the Jewish law. People don't go from being wimps to being on fire for Christ for something they know is a lie. And so it's off, that's even one that's even challenged is, well, people die for lies all the time. You're absolutely right, they do. But it's not because they think it's a lie, it's because they think it's true. Great, another job of self-debunking. So there's a difference there. How is this any different? Have you considered the possibility that the followers of Christianity thought it was true when in fact it wasn't? Not only that, the church exploded under immense persecution. No, it didn't. It exploded when it became the official state religion and the people had to convert. You keep making claims that aren't supported by the historical data, and then claiming that your claims are true. Why? Because you believe them? Sorry, that's just not how facts work. And we have 12 appearances, in referencing to the postmortem appearances, we have 12 appearances over 40 days to, or excuse me, over 40 days to over 500 people. It's fantastic. Is even a single appearance recorded anywhere other than the Bible? No, it isn't. So where did these appearances occur? The Bible gives locations for some of them, but the biggie, the one that was allegedly seen by 500 people? This one we have no date and no place for. It's just a vague reference to 500 people saw it. If I tell you 500 people saw me put a pot with a million dollars of gold coins in it in the storm drain, does my claim become more likely because I claimed that 500 people saw me do it? No, it doesn't. And the most likely reason that you feel confident in your beliefs is that you have never bothered to check your own claims. 
You never fact-checked your claims about the explosive growth of the church and the changed lives of the disciples. It fit with what you wanted to believe, so when someone said it to you, you just believed it. You never stopped to consider if your points about archaeology even proved the point that you intended to make, that Jesus was resurrected, failing to consider that they just affirmed details of your story that can be true, even if there was no resurrection. Use the brain that you claim God gave you. Look at your own alleged evidence from the perspective of a skeptic. If you did, would it convince you? Not likely. Guess that's why you need to teach this to children. With this information, those four points that we just made, this brings us to our question that has to be asked. What is the most reasonable explanation? What this requires is an unbiased look at all of the evidence, not just the natural, but the supernatural as well. A good investigator will look at all evidence, no matter how fantastic, and weigh it for its truth value. That's actually the true definition of being open-minded. It's not accepting everything as true, but being willing to look at all evidence to look for what is true. So do that, Amy. I dare you. Look critically at the points that you brought up. Not a single one pointed to a resurrection. Most of them you failed to establish even occurred. Conclusion, Jesus was, and still is, dead. And it requires an honest look at possible alternatives, which we're actually going to do in our next podcast that Trisha is going to head up, so I'm so excited. And this claim isn't true either. This is part one of one, and Trisha is never seen again on the channel, at least not until this date. Maybe Amy took her own advice and realized that none of the rest of the points supported her claims. Eh, not likely. I'll just enjoy my pot of gold. Hey, if Amy can pretend that the resurrection is true with no evidence, I can pretend my pot of gold is real. Live your life.